Hey everyone, when you're planning the rest of your life, it's really important to plan for a few contingencies. Understanding what happens to Social Security benefits in the event of a death is something that has to be understood. And in today's video, I'm going to tell you four things about survivor benefits that almost no one is talking about. But before we jump into this too deeply, if you haven't already, be sure to get my Social Security cheat sheet. This has all of the most important numbers and limits that pertain to Social Security, and it condenses it down to just one page. This is used by financial planners and CPAs all over the nation as a desk reference, and if you want your own copy, you can have it for free. I update this every year, and as long as you're on my email list, I'll send out the updated version as soon as we have it ready. So planning for death is not an easy thing to do. A lot of 50 and 60 year olds still feel invincible. and They don't plan their retirement with the contingency of one spouse dying before the other. But this is something that has to be thought about and survivor benefits from Social Security is the first line of income protection for a spouse that you leave behind. So today, let's talk about a few things pertaining to survivor benefits that very few people even know. First, we'll talk about how to determine if the person who died worked for enough years for survivor benefits to be paid from their work record. And then we'll also talk about the different categories of survivor benefits. Then we'll move on to how survivor benefits are calculated if someone dies early. And then we'll cover the Windexing formula. Have you ever heard of that? Most people haven't, but it's very important to know. And finally, we'll cover a filing strategy that's only available to those who are eligible for survivor benefits. Now stick with me, because we're gonna get into the weeds a little bit here, but I assure you, you'll learn something that you didn't know before, and it could mean that you or someone you know could get a higher benefit. So let's dive in by looking at the first part of this. Did the deceased person work long enough to qualify his spouse and other family members for benefits? Well, before any beneficiary can receive survivor benefits, the deceased person must have worked for enough years to be considered insured for Social Security. And there are two different ways that you can be insured, but the big broad rule is that if you work for at least 10 years, your beneficiaries can receive survivor benefits. That said, there are some exceptions to this where beneficiaries could still receive a survivor benefit if the work record is shorter than 10 years. This is an important rule to understand for individuals who die young. To determine whether a person worked long enough to qualify for benefits, the Social Security Administration counts work history by credits. You have to have a certain number of these credits to be considered insured by Social Security. In 2022, you get one credit for every $1,510 in earnings, and an individual can only earn up to four credits per year. Just be aware that the earnings amount required for one credit generally increases on an annual basis. And so depending on the age of death and the number of credits obtained at that time, a person will either be fully insured, which means that a deceased person's beneficiaries can receive full survivor benefits, or currently insured, which means that Social Security will only pay a limited amount of benefits. Now, I'll get into the weeds on the differences in payments in just a moment. For now, know that to be considered fully insured, you need to have earned at least one credit for every year since you turned 22. You need a minimum of six credits, but you never need more than 40. For example, let's say you were to die at 40. In that case, you'd need at least 18 credits, one for each year since you turned 22 to be considered fully insured by the Social Security Administration. To be considered currently insured means that you've earned six credits in the last three years. Now, the insured status of the deceased person becomes really important when we start talking about who can receive survivor's benefits. There are four different categories of survivor benefits. First, there are widow or widower's benefits. That's what we traditionally think of when we think of survivor's benefits. Someone dies and their spouse can get a survivor's benefits. But then there are mother's and father's benefits. These are also known as child and care benefits. And they will pay a survivor benefit to a spouse who has taken care of a deceased person's child who's under the age of 16. And then there are benefits payable to children. They can receive a portion of the deceased person's benefit up until they are a certain age. And finally, there are benefits payable to dependent parents. Now, not many people know about this one, but in short, the Social Security Administration will pay a benefit to a deceased person's parents if they were receiving at least one half of their support from the deceased person. Now, these different benefit types each work differently depending on your insured status. 
The easy part to remember is that if someone meets the definition of fully insured, all eligible beneficiaries can receive benefits. But if someone is currently insured, then Social Security would only pay out the child and care benefits or children's benefits. Benefits would not be eligible to dependent parents or to a surviving spouse. And all of this leads to the next part, the alternate calculation for early death. As many of you already know, with retirement benefits, 35 years are used in the calculation to determine the benefit, whether you've worked 35 years or not. So if you've only worked 20 years, your earnings history will show 20 years of earnings and 15 years of zeros. And needless to say, zeros in a calculation will drive down the average. So if someone dies early, there could be quite a few years of zeros in their 35 years of work history. Now that would be unfortunate, but thankfully, survivor's benefits aren't calculated in the exact same way as retirement benefits. If someone dies fully insured, there is an alternate calculation that differs from the normal calculation in two key areas. Instead of using the highest 35 years from work history, the Social Security Administration will take the number of years between the attainment of age 22 through the year of death and drop off the lowest five years. The number of years there is what's used instead of the fixed 35 number that's used for retirement benefits. For example, let's say that someone named John dies at age 40. The administration would index his earnings for inflation and look at the number of working years on his record beginning at age 22 and ending at his death. In this case, that's 19 years. Next, they'd drop off five of the lowest years. What would be left would be the highest 14 years of John's earnings. Since there are 168 months and 14 years, his average index monthly earnings would be the sum of the highest 14 years divided by 168. The result would then be applied to the benefits formula that was in effect in the year of John's death. But this is where yet another variance in the calculation comes in. If the deceased spouse was under the age of 62 when they died and their surviving spouse was not yet 60, the Social Security Administration will perform an alternate calculation to see if it produces a higher result for survivor's benefits. This is called Windexing. And it's one of the administration's famous word combination that stands for widow's indexing. This alternate calculation compares the benefits payable from doing the calculation with a formula in place during the year of death and then with the calculation in the earlier of the year the surviving spouse attains age 60 or the deceased would have attained age 62. So to fully understand how Windexing works and how this can make a difference, it's helpful to understand how the Social Security Administration accounts for inflation because that's really what this comes down to. There are two methods used by the administration to account for the impact of inflation to benefits. They use wage inflation as measured by the average wage index and price inflation as measured by the CPIW. The dividing line that determines which of these measurements are used is the benchmark or eligibility year. The eligibility year is simply the year that someone dies, becomes disabled, or turns 62. The summarized version of this is that before the year of eligibility, benefits are increased based on wage inflation. After the year of eligibility, benefits are increased based on price inflation. What the Windexing formula does is effectively moves the year of eligibility to a later year and allows the benefit to be calculated with more years of wage inflation built in. And since wage inflation is normally higher than price inflation, this should produce a higher primary insurance amount and resulting benefit payment. So let's go through a quick example and see how this would work in action. Let's assume that Jack was born in 1955 and his wife Susan was born in 1957, but Jack was killed in an accident in 1995. Now, the normal calculation would calculate Jack's PIA through the 1995 formula, and then it would add cost of living adjustments based on price inflation for every year thereafter. The alternate Windexing calculation would calculate his benefit as if his eligibility year was 2017, the year Jack would have been 62. This means that for the years between his death and 2017, his PIA would be increased by wage inflation. So how big of a difference can this make? Well, if you look at that specific period between 1995 and 2017, wage inflation outpaced price inflation by 25%. This means that Susan's survivor benefit would be considerably higher under the Windexing formula than it would have been under the normal formula. Now, one quirk about the Windexing formula you should know is that the alternate formula is only used for the surviving widow, 
not for anyone else normally eligible for survivor's benefits like children or parents. And last, there is the strategy that can supercharge your Social Security benefits if you know how to use it. Up until 2016, switching between Social Security benefits was possible through several popular filing strategies. For example, an individual could file for a spousal benefit and later switch back to their own benefit. This strategy would let a person collect a benefit while waiting on their own benefit to grow with those 8% per year delayed retirement credits. But there were some law changes in 2016 and most of these Social Security filing strategies were completely eliminated. But one is still in place, and it benefits those who are eligible for survivor benefits. So a general overview is that if you're eligible for both a survivor's benefits and your own benefit, you file for one benefit and let the other benefit grow as you wait. For example, it could make sense to file for a reduced survivor's benefit as early as 60. While you're drawing your survivor benefit, your own benefit grows every month you delay filing for it. At age 70, you simply switch back to your own benefit, which is now higher. The reverse of this would work as well. You could file for your own benefit as early as 62 and switch to a survivor benefit at full retirement age. So to see this in action, let's look at a couple of examples. Let's say Paula is 60. At 67, her full retirement age, she has her own benefit of $1,500 per month and a survivor's benefit of $1,600 per month. One approach would be for Paula to file for survivor benefits at 60. That would result in a reduction of 28.5%, which would give her a benefit of $1,144. But she'd be able to collect that benefit while her own benefit was growing. And once her own benefit had grown to the maximum at age 70, she'd simply switch to that benefit and start receiving $1,860 per month for the rest of her life. That would make a big difference in monthly benefits. But the reverse of this scenario could also be advantageous. Let's use the example of Jean, who is currently 62 years old, which is the earliest age you can claim your own benefit. And at full retirement age, she has her own benefit of $1,200 and a survivor's benefit of $1,800. The easy decision here is to file for her own benefit first, even though it would be reduced down to $840. At her full retirement age of 67 then, she would switch to a survivor's benefit. That way she would receive a benefit while she was waiting to get her full survivor's benefit. Just a quick tip here, survivor's benefit won't continue to increase beyond full retirement age, so there wouldn't be any reason to delay. So I know we've covered a lot of ground, but I think that understanding what to expect in payments and the basics of the calculations will help you spot inaccuracies. Because let me tell you, you can be certain about this. The Social Security Administration doesn't always get it right, and the burden is on you to understand how these benefits are calculated. Thanks for watching.